We'll do it right now. We, we can have a quick break. What I'm, what I'm ready to tell you about is the blood sacrifice ritual in Mexico. Oh, it's tiny. It's this tiny little... Yes, you, yes, it'll be a bottom right hand It's this tiny board. little fucker. I can barely see it even. Well, if, if you click on it, it can. you get a little expand button. Oh, yeah, there we go. Don't hurt me. <laughs> oh, in my, my, I'll get that later, okay? I mean, oh, you're trying to... Uh, there's me to be my, littering. Let me try. Yeah, let me okay. just save the world Dive, real quick. Right, yeah. <laughs> right before, before dinner. Yeah. All right, now. Okay, we're here at the new studio. You don't know, you don't know studios, right? Huh? But there's one truth in the cosmos. One cosmic truth. The truth is, you don't know, huh? You don't know. What's up? What's this, huh? All right, now. Miles Johnson. Let's say hi to Miles. <laughs> what? Hi, Miles. <laughs> hi, Miles. So anyway, we, you know, you got all these uh, questions that you sent me to uh, fill in on our uh, two-hour long interview the other day. And so let's just talk about a few things. And thanks for asking about the new studio facilities here. We're here at the, uh, at the Hub in Austin. And I'm a client of Conscious Ventures. And we're working with Brett Thomas and Randall Wilborn and a bunch of other very talented and sexy motherfuckers, huh? We love these people. And right now we're here at the Hub. And this is where uh, our new studio is. And I was fortunate enough to get a chance to buy in on the studio, so I'm one of the owners. So anyway, here's the deal. We were fortunate enough to be interviewed by Miles on my, I guess we could call, world debut last uh, November, I think it was. And then shortly after that, we did that Leap Project interview. And uh, it's practically gone viral. I mean, I'm just about to decide myself with disbelief and everything like this. But there's been a number of you know questions that have come up. You know, and then there's, well, what is Laguna Catamaca? So, right, we were there. So how do I tell you what Laguna Catamaca is? I looked it up on Wikipedia, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, Laguna Catamaca is a, it's like a caldera. It's a volcano, you know, it's extinct. And so it blew its top or whatever. And now it's got all this water in there. So it's like turned into a lake. But as far as, you know, lakes go in the earth, it's very young. In other words, it's like about... 10,000 years old. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. like a, a baby. Yeah. But also because of the volcanic nature of it. That's where it has all that spiritual energy mm -hmm. and stuff. And that's why we had to go, like, go swimming in the waters. And we had to apologize to the north. Apologize to the earth, south, east, and west. Actually, this is more corresponding to apologizing to the water. Apologizing to the air. Apologizing to the earth. We did all of those things. You know, I, it, was, it was a ritual, a ceremonial ritual. I was under somewhat of a trance and during the recounting of apologizing to the earth. I was referring to it as my mother and, and I broke down in crying and everything. So it's a moving experience yeah. for me. But then when we got over, I was like, okay, Enrique, here's the deal. I said, you know, now we're going to apologize to the fire. He's like, homeboy, you can't contaminate <laughs> the fire. Huh? You don't worry about that. Don't worry about the fire. Huh? You're about, yeah, you're worried about the wrong <laughs> thing. Huh? So anyway, it was, it was very fascinating. But Enrique Verdone himself is a very fascinating man. We uh, made arrangements to meet with Enrique before we went down there. Enrique Martin Verdon is what I call a sorcerer. Uh, he may not refer to himself as that. He, he actually wants me to introduce him to the world as the good son. And Enrique has a huge audience, which is like 99% Spanish speaking. So one of the things you know that I'm doing is helping uh, introduce Enrique to the English speaking world. Okay. All right. yeah. And it was fascinating because when we were down there, it, there had been a Russian psychic who's famous down there, and he came down there with his team a couple of years before, and they were, you know, filming everything, and so, you know, he's opening himself to the world. But when Rick and I um, went to Katamako, which is a, a resort town, it just so happened that the man who we had already, uh, you know, booked the rooms with at that hotel, it just so happens by coincidence and whatever, and I don't believe in coincidence. But uh, he, he was Enrique Berdon's cousin. Right? I mean, so it's like weird, you know? Yeah. I mean, in a town of like, I don't know, a quarter Small of a million people world. or something, yeah. <laughs> and so I just flat out asked this man, I said, is Enrique Martin Berdon one of the most powerful men in Mexico? because I've been telling my team that because that's the truth. 
And this man, his cousin, sat there and he thought about it for a second and he looked up and he looked down and he looked directly, direct, me directly in the eyes and he said, at this time. So yes, at this time, Enrique is uh, one of the most powerful people in Mexico. The people of Mexico are, I'm not going to say more spiritual than the people in the United States, but it it seems that way. I mean, they are, they're raised in a different culture, so that takes a big toll on people as well. They're much closer to the earth, mm -hmm. and the, and the earth mother, you know. Yeah. Even with their, all of their Catholic influences, yeah. which, you know, I don't bad mouth the Catholics, but we know that it, it had a somewhat devastating effect on our culture. Mm -hmm. But their magic and rituals, which have been around for thousands of years and even being practiced around Lake Catamaco, because the thing is, Laguna Catamaco is known as one of the most holy and spiritual places in all of Mexico. And on top of that, and having, having nothing ostensibly to do with that, uh, they are a resort, you know, vacation, low, you know, locale or destination in Mexico. For instance, you know, if, if you or I would, would, or some of our friends wanted to go to a fancy vacation, they might go to Aspen, Colorado or something. But down there, you might be, uh, the people who done good in life may uh, go to Laguna Catamaco. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And have absolutely nothing to do with the occult or any, mm -hmm. or any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But that being said, the entire, it's, Laguna Catamaco is known as the city of witches. So all throughout Mexico it's known, I mean, if you need to hire a witch or whatever, you go down there. They've got good ones, bad ones, in-between ones, fake ones, real ones, anything you can imagine. Really, anything you can imagine. And being from the conscious community, being accepted by the conscious community for so many years, it was hard for me to relate exactly what I was doing down there. Because, as the listeners know, I'm going down there to perform blood sacrifice rituals. And these, uh, and, and, and no people were harmed. This is, this is, the, and what I want everyone to understand is these animals that are sacrificed are bred specifically for this purpose. These animals have a purpose in their life and are treated better than other farm animals. And there really is a holy and sacred purpose to this. And unbeknownst or, you know, unexpected by me, one month ago I started going through something really weird and I was doing my intense workouts and I woke up after one of these workouts crying uncontrollably. And I reached out to one of my sisters who had been working with me from Colorado, who I since found out that she uh, is a certified life coach. But that doesn't even describe what she is because she's an energy mover. Yeah. And so for the first time in my life, I'm not going to say how old I am, but after living, you know, a lifetime in objective reality, this you know, lovely woman who I've known for 31 years and who I she went to the same school at Lubbock, Texas. Mm -hmm. You're from Houston, right? Yeah, outside of Houston. Mm -hmm. So, kind of very similar accent. Yep. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, she right off the bat was like moving energy in my body. Yeah. You know, I, yeah, that's magical. I mean, it is. I mean, and she, and so what she told me right off the bat, and she has guides, and she was talking to them to them this girl, and she's a very powerful person. And she informed me that I'm basically having a kundalini awakening right now, and that she has not had one. And so it was like a little bit intimidating, <laughs> but yeah. scary, right? You know, because yeah, I'm not, I, I wasn't in the market for a kundalini awakening, right? I mean, is that new and I know, and sometimes you have to like cry and control it, but you know, and you're like, hey, it's a tough guy that never cried in the last year, you know, yeah. decades ago or whatever, so. It's a trip. So we've been working with Kira, and since that time, you know, she's been having me do light exercises to like activate my my, don, my lower dantian, you know, my middle dantian, my, my upper dantian, and the, the hata and all this stuff. And I, you know, I don't know how to do all this stuff. I'm just a beginner. Fortunately, I've been immersed in the uh, conscious community here for three or four years, and a lot of the people who are the leaders of this community who are more my age have been so gracious to like be my to help me and to be my guys and to and I've just been accepted in this community and it's the most that's overwhelming for me. I mean I've I will i I've you know, like had friends and stuff like this. I, I was uh, like not some high school outcast or anything. But just to be accepted in a in a community like that where it's so 
It's so it's real. On, yeah, genuine, just love and acceptance. And it's not something you find within a lot of people. Uh, not a, a whole group of people that makes it community. Uh, you just said it, love. And that's what Kira, at first, several months ago, I was like, gosh dang, look. Is that the only thing she can talk about? Love, love, love. No, in, in the, I know it. I know it. I, I'm trying, Bridget. I'm trying to learn. And, and she just like basically grabbed me by the neck and she's like, listen, motherfucker. Love. You understand me? And, and I was, you know, mentally I trying to, and, and I'm starting to because now she's moving my energies. And there's been something else that uh, has been going on that I've been telling, you know, some knowledge some Facebook and stuff. It's, that's another very powerful lady that I've known for 31 years. She's one of the most beautiful women in love in the world, and I am in love with her. And she loves me too, you know. And so it's. Yeah, that's nice. It is. Can I just share that with someone to, and have a reciprocated? Yeah, to be in love for the first time in your life at that is crazy. X years old. You X, know what? That's X, amazing. X, I'm so X, happy X for years you. old, right? Seriously. I mean, yeah, so. On White Monkey Mountain, they've got these guy dang monkeys. And they're white, you know, so. Was it because of uh, a astrological significance or a moon of the planets or some kind of a thing that it meant that he had that power at that time? I don't know. I think it was because, he, it, and let me tell you why, or let me tell you his explanation for it, because he comes from a, he comes from a family of sorcerers. But he was somebody that, um, he was somebody that, uh, who forsook the ways of his ancestors. In other words, he was not interested in sorcery. He was more maybe interested in disco or, you know, you know, things that young people do. And so he went away from that. And even though he had been raised in that, even though maybe up to 10 or 12 years, but maybe when he turned about 24 or 25 years old, he decided to, to get back into it after being a bricklayer and stuff like that for years. And uh, one thing that he was very proud of that he told me is that for the last nine years, and this man is 52 years old, and for the last nine years he's been making a living solely from doing his uh, his work. I mean, I call it sorcery. I that's probably not what he calls it, but uh, and you know, of course, he has his compound and everything like that. So everyone in Mexico um, has to work very hard. They have a vibrant economy there. The fact that there, it takes 20 pesos to make one dollar makes people think, oh, their their economy is weak and all that stuff. It's no, that's really just that their currency is dis, disvalued from ours. So everybody there, from what I can see, who wants a job can get one. But at the same time, yes, they have to work very hard. And so he was very proud of that. And where does that? What happened with the ceremony that was would have, would have been so scary? your crew I mean were they justified in not coming with you well they were and we even had a conversation about it and there was the reasons that they were afraid because people are real fear based anyway but immediately as soon as they told me that I was totally forgiving of them because I knew that it was meant to be and I didn't know and I was even think I was even telling them the day the next day on the white magic ritual not even half jokingly Lucifer didn't want y'all to be there you know filming the deal now Enrique Berdon uh, was a little bit disappointed um, but we filmed the next day the white magic ritual with Enrique and Yane the beautiful sorceress and the old man the mysterious old man and the boat captain who made sure we never photographed any of the serial numbers of his boat and then he also did not want to be photographed and so you know he didn't know what this documentary was was going to be about and that also maybe I, I don't think that Enrique Bredon has a bad reputation in Catamaco but he's he's one of the heavy hitters you know what I mean he's the guy up on White Monkey Mountain and he's the guy that has got the, the fucking power or knows how to touch the power Okay, hold on. I, lo I lost Miles. I can't hear him. I can't hear Miles, okay. Brett. Are you okay? Okay. That's no, okay. Okay. I, I can hear you now. For a second there, I couldn't hear you, Miles. Yeah, I'd hit a thing called a mute button. Okay, all right. I know what that is. But I, I, I knew it worked on, on you. It's just a th it's a thing with compliance and broadcasting. If you look at a lot of these documentaries, like building things in Alaska, 
they even mask out the registration numbers of any plane or boat. Yeah. So I think it's it's just it's 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 relatively standard that, and if you yeah. don't shoot it in the first place, you don't have to mask it out. Yeah, that's why we yeah good call. But it would seem that you were given uh, the opportunity to have an experience, which uh, meant that you could uh, you could actually experience this on your own without the I mean, if the documentary team were there. You would have been uh, it would have been distracting, perhaps. I think so, and it could have taken away from the sense of mystery, you know, because uh, my retelling of this tale is, uh, frankly, um, you know, I, I did my first, you know, world premiere video with you, and then I subsequently did a uh, an interview with the Leak Project, and that 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 it's already had like eighteen thousand five hundred views. So, I, but in, and it's not really the book that people mostly want to hear about. It's this blood sacrifice ritual. It, it's somehow compelling, you know, and. Uh, well, what, why do they do it? What does it actually mean? I mean, uh, we hear about these blood sacrifices and we've seen it on Hammer Horror movies and stuff like that. We all get very, you know, we all get very sort of scared or you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, maybe, you know, maybe there's other things involved that we need to know about. Can you tell us about that? Well, um, here's the deal. Every time you go eat a hamburger, that's a blood sacrifice ritual minus the ritual. So, you're cheating yourself every time you eat a hamburger and get meat from the store. Now, if you're a, a vegetarian and a vegan, which maybe the human being was designed to be, but I'm not, then I don't, I can't, you know, make a rebuttal. But all, all I can tell you is that since I have changed about a month ago, I'm now realizing that I'm treating these animals with love. These animals are special animals. From the moment they were born, these animals are special animals and they're treated better than the other farm animals. And they have special traits and characteristics which are needed for these different occult groups. Like there was a beautiful goat, male goat, I mean with the horns and everything, with the long, you know, white hair that they did. I've seen on one of their, you know, videos recently. But the goat that I um, sacrificed was the goat that had been born and bred to, to be the goat to be sacrificed this last, this, you know, spring uh Equinox. This last, equinox. Yeah, this last spring yeah. equinox. Well, I got him ahead of time, okay? Because, you know, we had been talking about them and talking about making the deal with Enrique Padron when we were in the United States. And he was like, okay, that sounds good. He's like, hit me up when you get here. You know what I mean? In other words, you know, get over here and, and then we'll fi finalize the deal. When I went and talked to Enrique, uh, the, the, they brought the maestro in and this is in, and he was one wearing one of these Guevara shirts. I can't remember exactly what they're called, but it's kind of like a traditional Mexican shirt, but you're with a, you know, nice embroidery on it. And I'm telling you, this man looked at least 10 years younger than he is. When you look at some pictures of him, especially on that, those pictures taken by Gerald L. Long, he looks his age in those pictures, which is about 52 or 53. But when I saw him and on the footage that I have, that uh, you, you've even post, you've even put your, you know, used one of those pictures. Uh, he looks considerably younger, considerably. You know, he looks like a man who's, you know, maybe 42 years old or something like this. He's a very powerful individual. He doesn't, uh, his English is better than my Spanish. And we talked about a few things. And he showed me this team that came from Russia that's a famous psychic from Russia and they traveled all the way across the world with their documentary film team and he showed me some stuff the newspaper article and him doing rituals with this guy who's famous in Russia I guess I mean if I said his name I doubt you'd know who he is but it, it was all very interesting but what he, that guy and his whole team he charged him uh, two thousand dollars in American okay and so he reasoned that, you know, since it was just basically just me there, you know, my team chickened out and everything like this, he would charge me $1,000 American. Of course, I instantly agreed. And so it was, so then that's when they had to put in the call to go get the clairvoyant girl who lives in a nearby village because they, apparently they have to have the clairvoyant girl. So at this point, I still did not know anything about Lucifer, but I knew that there was going to be, you know, I knew, I knew about the goat because they already told me, you know, not only, you know, what I'm kind of getting from my man, you know, whether it's the goat, you know, the clairvoyant girl, the falling down, the white magic ritual, you know, they bought all the flowers. There's many flowers. Um, I don't know if you've had time to look at those videos from the white magic ritual, but, you know, they, it, you know, and so. Uh, but is this the balancing of energies? 
Is there some kind of balance involved? Here? It really is, Miles. I think that's really what it is because on the black magic ritual, that if we would have delayed it even one day, it would not have been on the autumnal equinox. But of course, I had already been uh, drink, uh, drinking, of course, eating meat and all this stuff, maybe even doing whatever else people do in Mexico. And, you know, so not being cleansed or whatever. But he made, he made sure to tell me that by midnight to not eat any meat. So here's one thing that we keep saying, a recurring thing that we keep saying, like with these ayahuasca rituals in Peru and everywhere else, these shamans, they have all these lists of rules. You know what I mean? You know, do this, don't do that. You know, don't do, you know, don't have sex, all this stuff, all this stuff. Well, you know, when it comes down to where I'm dealing with this shaman, you know, in the jungles of the Amazon or whatever, like it was in, you know, Puerto Maldonado in Peru or whatever, or in Mexico, wherever it is, these motherfuckers, they get one look at me and they're like, fuck it, this guy ain't going to follow in the rules. They're like, one, we'll get one rule. I get one rule. That's it. One rule. Yeah. So the one rule was uh, don't eat meat. And did you do that? Oh. Did you not eat meat? No, no, no. I followed the rules. If, if you can get me, okay. if you can get me down to one rule, I'll follow the damn rule. You know, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I'm not a law, I, I believe in the, you know, I know that the law, laws, rules and stuff like that are like weak reflections of cosmic law. You know, so I am a law abider. You know what I mean? You know, am I just if if I do, you know, look at some four twenty or something like that every once in a while. That's that's not here nor there. You know, everybody's doing that, and on top, I'm just a law abider. You know, but especially of cosmic law. Okay, describe cosmic law, please, because it's quite important here. Well, you know, it's just uh, be kind to others. You know, that's part of it. And uh, it's just, I don't know, it's a very subjective thing for every, for every person. Okay, well, uh, welcome to part two. And on this part, you want to talk about blood, the, the detail of that ritual. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah, the blood sacrifice ritual. So anyway, I made the deal with Enrique Berdon, you know, and it was a, it was a, it was a money amount of money that it's, a, I guess, you know, it's maybe a large amount of money, but it was, of course, we were already prepared to do this and it was within the budget. And so, of course, we immediately agreed. And his henchmen came, came, and of course, I left the money in the hotel with my man, right? You know, I didn't take the money with me. Um, and so, at, because we had not agreed on the amount of money yet. That's why. Okay, so anyway, we, uh, we went up there to Monkey Mountain and uh, met this beautiful sorceress, Yane. They have, uh, uh, advised me that they were going to have to go get the clairvoyant girl, the 16-year-old clairvoyant girl who's going to be involved in the ritual she was from a nearby village and so they just made me comfortable with some lemonade or something like this and uh and you know and we waited and then while we were still waiting um or you know i waited for about 20 minutes and then enrique came and he brought me a black robe okay this black robe is basically just like the one that i use here in the United States and I had my black robe with me which is a black robe that I personally made with a sewing machine and I had but it was back at the hotel I didn't know we were going to do the ritual that night but you know I wanted to do it on the autumnal equinox yes. what is the significance of the black robe well you know and I think you've asked me I've, I, you've asked me that before and the truth is I really don't know but the thing is black it's a color of mystery right it's, uh, you know, it's something that's going on in the darkness. So maybe it's something for the initiated that, you know, but at the same time, in many of these rituals that I'm in, uh, there are, depending on what the ritual is, people with white robes. So yeah, there's a lot of symbology and I, uh, and then there's the purple, purple. Robe oh, well, yeah, that pur yeah, purple, you know, it's a royal color. But, you know, when we think of black and we think of white, of course, we think of these, you know, Masonic ideas, you know, this black and white, you know, checkerboard, the the game of whatever, you know, duality. Right. You know, black and white. So and uh, you know, we see so much of that thrust upon us in the media and everything you know it's like every it's like the whole world has to be black and white you know you have to agree or you have to disagree you have to get engaged with this it's our narrative we don't care if you hate it or if you love it we just want you to be engaged you know and so that's a very profound idea so uh, go go ahead with what okay happened. so here's the deal enrique came and he said okay the time was ready all right then he gave me that black robe and so i put on the black robe he was wearing his regular clothes with what he was wearing when i met with him it's this wero shirt you know and his sunglasses and his uh, pants and everything like this 
And so, and the henchman stayed out there and we advanced and we came out of his office, still in the compound. And then we went over here to where the pentagram was. And the pentagram was probably... Can you it was, explain the significance of this pentagram is in everything? What, what, what's the significance of this? Well, first of all, a pentagram is a symbol of a man. You know, you've got the, the you've got the you know man, humankind, womankind. You know, the arms and the legs, and then the head coming up like that. So it's a symbol of a man for one thing. It's also got the number of five associated with it, and for the you know five points of it. Uh, interestingly enough, um, you know Jack Parsons, who created the modern uh, solid fuel rocket booster, has a cavity in it that's an exact pentagram. So we see that this pentagram is more than an idea. It's something that, in physical reality, it's somehow one of these shapes that reality is built built on. You know, like, much like these, you know, platonic solids I was talking about earlier. So anyway, in the in the photographs by Gerald O'Long, I don't know what this is they have. That's a that's a pentagram. I mean, it's up in the air. I mean, it's two or three stories tall, but it's a complete pentagram and it's on fire. The pentagram I went into was like burned in the ground or maybe tar or something like this, but we stood outside of the pentagram, but you can easily see the pentagram. And in the middle of the pentagram was a flaming cauldron. You know, 3 or 4, you know, 3 and a half feet above the ground with a big brazier, you know, a big metal pit with all these logs in it, just blowing up fire, you know. And so we stood outside of the pentagram. And he said, do not step on the lines of the pentagram. And so we each took one step and got inside the pentagram. Then he started telling me a bunch of stuff. Not all of it did I understand because he speaks Spanish, but he actually translated very good. But I've been in the, in the, involved in the occult for a lifetime. So these ideas and concepts he's telling are very familiar to me. We do our Wittershins. We do our counterclockwise movement and we are praying to the east and to the north and to the south and to the west and he instructs me to hand, hold my hands out like this above the brazier to feel the power. Well, of course you're feeling the power. You're not going to get too close to it. You got to burn your hands off. You know what I mean? Fire Fire is something that is that is is one of the, the the spiritual element that is closest in its physical reality where we live to its spiritual component. The very you know just throwing this in the very next day on the white magic ritual, I had to apologize to the water for contaminating it. I had to apologize to the earth for contaminating it. I had to apologize to the air for contaminating it. And then when I was finished, I was like, okay, let's apologize to the fire. And he's like, homeboy, you ain't gotta. You know, apologize to the fire. You can't contaminate that, huh? What's up? You can't contaminate that fire. That's what they got the goddamn fire, huh? So anyway, we did these rituals, and I thought it was all very nice. I was like, well, yes, yeah, so we've really done a good ritual and everything like this. And so then he instructs me that we're headed to the sacred underground cave. And I'm talking about a cave that is man-made. It's a cave, I guess, he and his, whatever the people made, but it has had a candle lighted in it for over five years. It's always had a candle continually lit into it. Okay, he said, you know, we've already got this stuff ready. You know, we've got the goat, we've got the girl, right? The goat and the girl, okay? We're going underground, that's it. That's fucking it, all right? I said, okay, here's the deal. Let's do this shit. So anyway, we go over there into these, you know, cobblestone steps. You know, it's descending down into the earth, and so we start going down the steps, and there's candles on every step. So you, you can see where you're going down these steps. And then we're going down the steps, going down the steps, going down the steps. And then we turn to the left, and then you're looking out into the room. And it's got stone walls all around. It's got skulls it's got all kinds of stuff and anyway are you talking human skulls no just like skulls of animals and stuff like that you know and different type of stuff but you really don't see any of that stuff because right off the bat your entire attention is taken by this fucking statue that's like towards the back of the room and he, I didn't know it was going to be this in the goddamn statue of Lucifer, a 10 foot tall statue of Lucifer, the most beautiful statue you have ever seen. He's standing like this. He's standing like this. 
He's got the most masculine body imaginable, you know, the body of like a bodybuilder, but it's like even almost like exaggerated. He's got a big smile on his face. He's got blank eyes. You can't see his eyes. And he's got these horns coming out of his head right here. Okay, and he's standing like this, and he's got an erection, as in a manly erection. In other words, with buttocks, you know, slightly, you know, clenched forward with a type of uh, male member that is, you know, protruding out, uh, quite dramatically along with the is this is this statue human looking is it the baphomet of what or yeah or what oh no no it's not that? a baphomet it's a man it's a man it's a man it's a man but the man does have horns it's a man that's what he looks like and he's red and he's painted red and i was like well, what is this you know and this is lucifer okay and so here's the deal that's when i realized that's i was so captivated by that statue it wasn't until we came closer into the room that I was realized, oh my God, there's something, there's something at the base of the statue. And what I'm talking about is there was, a, there was a, 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 a totally nude clairvoyant girl writhing in ecstasy, laying at the base of the statue of Lucifer with her eyes closed in a trance. This person was not an actor or an actress. This shit was 100% real. And Enrique started throwing the alcohol around. I don't know what kind of alcohol it is. It's, it's rum alcohol, you know, or something like that. And then there's this, you know, this incense is just overpowering you with this, you know, this smell of incense. And, uh, you know, and this girl is moaning and she's moaning. Oh, you can't remember. You know, you don't understand Spanish anyway, so you really don't know what she's saying. Oh, you know, and everything like this. I mean, glistening sweat all over her, you know, nude body and her. Uh, pubis or whatever you want to call it was like shaved in other words so it's like you know and it's just a sweat just sweating profusely and there was the power and I was already starting to feel the power and then Enrique started slinging that alcohol right around and slinging it around the room he's getting on everything he's getting on me and I said what's up I said give me that motherfucker you know I held my hand out like that he gave me the goddamn bottle you know and I was uh, I took the bottle, I gave it back to him. I mean, I don't know that's that's part of the ritual of God damn. You're slinging out car around in a room, I'm gonna fucking drink something, you know what I mean? And he got him the uh the incense and everything. And this woman was just and he encouraged me to go near the statue and to touch the statue. And to touch the statue. And so I went to the statue and the statue was perfect. It was perfect down to the last detail. And he encouraged me to touch the statue. And so I was running my hands all over the statue, and it was a 10 foot tall statue of Lucifer, but it's on, because this is kind of the weird deal about it, because he's telling you put your hands on this statue, and it's a statue of a, um, a naked man, right? And so you're like, you know, not gay or anything, but not nothing wrong with that, but you know, I'm just following the instructions of the, of the sorcerer. So I'm running my hands all over this, beautiful like masculine body and even but, but since it's on a two-foot pedestal I only come up to a certain height and I'm hugging the statue and hugging its legs and stuff like that and then I come around to the back and, and I'm hugging it there and it's just like this that the butt or the anus or whatever of the statue of Lucifer happens to be right like where your face is you know what I mean so that's I don't know if that was calculated or what so you're just you know basically like loving this statue even, you know, touching the, um, you know, the genitals of the statue and everything like that. And shit is just getting heat, heated up, man. I mean, it's just fucking, you start hearing this ringing in your ears, man. And that's when they fucking start to get you activated. And that's when he fucking starts blowing that getting, you know. How do they get you activated? Yeah, dude, it just, uh, we're having all, all the breakup all, in the picture all, at the moment. All of this stuff, uh, everything's just coming together. And what it is, is I was being pulled into a trance. Pulled into a trance with the, the the visual aspects of the cave and the statue and Enrique Bardone explaining the things to me and a 16-year-old totally nude girl in front of the altar writhing literally in ecstasy. I mean, she was fixing to come off this motherfucker. And I mean, this shit, she, I was getting in the trance too. And, and, and then I drank some more alcohol and then Enrique, out totally out of the blue, he said, Manifesto! Manifesto! 
And he was yelling at that statue. He was trying to tell it to manifest. I said, what the fuck is going on? I said, is, it goddamn, is this statue going to come to life or what? I mean, I don't know what what the hell to expect. You know what I mean? And he's like, and he's like, get, get her right here in front of the girl on this altar and everything. He, but he didn't tell me to. But I touched the girl. And I had my hands on her arm. And she was practically coming. He didn't tell me to touch her, but I, 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 I put my hands on her arm. And she was practically coming off this motherfucker, man, in a goddamn sweat. I mean, the fucking sweat was just fucking coming off of me. And it was just fucking coming off of her. And it was just a lot of fucking sweat. And I was kneeled down, kneeled down there, holding on to the girl like that. And then I fell for one of the oldest tricks in the book. I was just sitting there just like totally in trance. And then bang! He fucking rang this huge fucking bell right in my ear, you know, sur you know, surreptitiously, you know, where I didn't know it. And I was just like, ah, ah, you know, it's like, it totally, you know, it brings you out of your reverie. I was just, ah, you know, and, and then, and then before I could even calm down, I turned around and there was fucking Yane, the beautiful sorceress. Dressed in a black robe, just like I was. I don't know how that bitch got down there. And she had on a fucking leash. She had a goat. A full-size goat. You understand me? And that was the mother... That's the goat. That's the goat. We had already been messing with the knife. Enrique had already run the knife over the girl's chest. And he looked at me to say, Do you understand? You understand what I'm saying? In other words, I don't know what the next level is. You know what I'm saying? But he's he's rubbing this knife, a ceremonial dagger, over a human being's skin. And I looked at him. I said, yes. I said, yo entiendo. Yo entiendo. So it's not like he, you know, has not warned me where this might go. But the, here's the deal. And so there's Yane, and there was the fucking goat right there. You know, and that motherfucker goat, that goddamn goat, he was just, it just, he was chewing the cut. <laughs> just sitting there like, you know, looking, looking like goats do. Real dumb, just mm, chewing the cud. This is a goat that's been treated good his whole life, a goddamn ceremonial goat. And then, but that's when it overcame me that I realized that the responsibility that had been put on me because a goddamn Now it was time to do or die. You understand what I'm saying, huh? Hey, God dang. I didn't, you know, I didn't come halfway around the world, you know, to look like a chicken in front of my new friends. You understand? And they didn't have to tell me where that knife was. It wasn't this knife right here, but it was, it, it, this one reminds me of it, but it was a ceremonial dagger. I ain't God dang. It was right over there by the girl where I've heard been rubbing over that girl and everything like that. And that's when I got down. I mean, you know what you have to do. You and, and, and let me tell you, I had a, a moment of weakness where I looked right there at the goat, and that goat, he just looked Meh, just like that. That goat, he didn't fucking see any of the shit coming. He didn't see none of the shit coming. All right. And I was even had a weak thought to myself, thinking, "Hey, you got that goat. That goat didn't do ro nothing wrong to me, huh?" And so I was. I had a moment of hesitation, but I mean, it was it was so short of a moment because I would not have been, uh, you know, I would have been embarrassed in front of my new friends. And so I just walked over there to Yane, and I mean, she was just looking at me with these black eyes. I mean, she is so beautiful. Yane, dressed just like I was, in a black robe, just holding that deal. I mean, how the fuck they got there, I don't know. I, it doesn't even make sense that they could have even snuck up on me like that. You know what I mean? And then they ring the goddamn bell, and then all of a sudden the motherfuckers are there. You know, what the fuck is going on? So anyway, I grabbed that leash, and Yane looked at me, and she's so beautiful. But I just didn't even look at her, and I had a goddamn knife, you know, and I just got that goddamn knife. I just put that knife right there on that, you know, stump and everything like that. And I got that motherfucking goat, and I got him right here. And goddamn, I, I just picked that motherfucker up, and I didn't slam him. I just, you know, I put him down there, and then I grabbed him, and I started going after that motherfucker! I just started tearing that fucking bitch up! And it got, the fucking blood was going everywhere, man! Everywhere! It got down. And the motherfucker, and, and it, they think, you know, those people, you know, they're tearing out his heart and holding it above their head to where all this blood come out. So I think I'm gonna do that. So I get the goddamn knife and I stick it in, you know, up in there. But it's, it's rib cage or something. You know, I don't know the anatomy of a goat. 
was like, fuck that shit, man. I just fucking threw that goddamn knife down and I just picked that motherfucker up. His tongue was already sticking out of his head. He wouldn't even, you know, I just picked that motherfucker and I just slammed that motherfucker down on the ground, huh? I broke him. I broke that motherfucker. And then, so he was dead. And so then, uh, I looked at Enrique and he said, and he pointed up there as if, you know, you, you go upstairs to go, go over there with the henchman. And so I went up there and I went up there and I said, fuck that, I'm not going to do that. And I didn't go with the henchman. I just went out to the motherfucking jungle. And I was just, ah, 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 just go up to the fucking bushes and to being torn up by thorns and shit, you know, rocks and all this stuff. And then it was just like when I started realizing that I was in the jungle and then I was on the earth. And then I look up there in the sky and it was the moon. And I said, ah! And then I started getting, you know, thinking that I might get tired and so I wanted to go back to the camp. But I said, no, I have to, you know, I have to do this. And so I picked up a boulder. I picked up a boulder. I, I kind of had to like, you know, pull it out of the ground and stuff, you know. And I picked it up, and I mean, got dang big boulder, man. It was about, I don't know, it was, you know, 50 or 60 pounds or something like that. I'll take, I said, I'll take this boulder right here. I'll take this mother, mother, mother. But then I was like, no, I can get one bigger. So I fuck, fuck that, man. I threw it down on the ground, and I got this bigger boulder. And I got it up, and I picked it up like this. And then I was like, oh, fuck that, man. That motherfucking boulder's too heavy. So I threw that one down, and I got the first one. And I got that boulder, and I picked it up, and then I was, went back. And I went back to the compound. I was marching with my boulder. I was holding it here to the chest, and I could see my goddamn, you know, moon right there and everything. And then, boom, I came out of those bushes and all those briars and everything. I busted out in those compound, and I had that boulder hug my head. I said, You see? You see? It's just like Cain and Abel. It's just like Cain and Abel in the Bible. And his henchmen didn't know what to do. And, but, Enrique was standing in front of them. I came towards him and he held his hand in front of his man like that. He's like, hold your ground. You hold your ground on this motherfucker. And that's what they did. They held your ground. And then, then I, so I turned around away from them. And I threw that boulder down on the ground so hard into the earth. It made a thud. It went boom. And you could feel it. And then goddamn, I turned around to them. And I said, you see? It's just like Cain and Abel. And so, uh, that I calmed down then, and uh, they they knew everything it was okay that I wasn't gonna like attack them with that boulder, and so they relaxed and you could see a sigh of relief going off their chest and everything like that. So anyway, that's when Enrique approached me and he instructed me because I still had on my black robe. He he just pointed to these sinks over here and everything. He he you know showed me to go um, wash my robe in the sink. In other words, it's a part of the occult that you're supposed to clean your own house. You know, take care of your own business and stuff like this. And so I was to wash my own, you know, black robe. And so of course I took it off and I put it in the water. You know, I put it on some water and stuff like that. I mean. They got they got old ladies and stuff like that that take care of that shit around there. So I mean, I I just made a I made a point to show that I was really you know doing the washing and doing the work and everything like this, you know. And then I just let it get let it go down there, and then so I went over there back to Enrique and his men, and he gave me the final instructions for what we were going to do on the white magic ritual the next day. And I assured him that the film team would be there because I was going to be showing up alive. That would be worth a lot to them, and so that's exactly what happened. And and his henchman, the one that they were all scared of, took me back to the hotel, and he was instructed to get the money from me. And so I went and I took him to Rick's room, and they stayed there and waited for me. And I went to my room, and I got a thousand dollars, and I came back and I gave it, and and I gave it to that man and, and got my final instructions. And then I went out on the town of Catamaco. The, the air smelled like electricity. I was so much blood already pumping it through my veins and I got lost in the town. It's like every time I left my hotel, like seriously, usually like, okay, here I am, you know, north, south, east, west, you know, getting lost. I mean, so the whole town is like very weird. And I went, ended up 
running around different parts of the town, almost like a madman. Of uh, I had washed up, and of course I still had blood on me. I mean, I, I wasn't just covered like with blood, but I mean, but you know, people in this town they know what happens in this town. Let me tell you, nobody would even look at me. There wasn't that many people out, but then I was ready to get home, and I tried to get a cab. There was no cab drivers would pick me up. No one would. Everyone ran away from me like I was the devil or something. But maybe I, you know, maybe even been drinking more or something. You know, there's maybe scientific reasons for this. And I just kept getting lost. And then there was these dogs, and there was a bunch of kind of just weird stuff. But finally, at the bus station, I convinced this guy because see, I was like, it came to a point where I was like holding out money, which would be a lot of money in Mexico for anyone, a cab driver, anyone to give me a ride home. And you see, this is this is this is amount of money. I mean, I don't know how much it would be in American, probably less than a hundred dollars, right? But over there, I mean, goddamn, that's a, that's a month's wages and everything like that. But you got a man, you know, covered with blood over here holding out money, trying to give you a ride, you know, get a ride. It's you get something you might want to think about, huh? Especially. Yeah, it's mildly disconcerting. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of how it went down. But anyway, the, finally, I convinced this guy that I wasn't going to, you know, like kill everybody. And they, uh, they he called this other guy and he gave me a ride home back to the hotel. And so for after that point, I wasn't eating any meat. And the very next morning at 10 a.m. in the morning, the, the henchman came and uh, Enrique and Yane and what he did is he put Yane in our vehicle in other words so that we wouldn't get lost he put the beautiful sorceress in the vehicle with me and Rick and we went to the flower market first we got stuff we wanted she went to the flower stuff to get all these flowers and stuff and then we went to the Laguna Catamaco and you remember Laguna Catamaco and, and Cat, the town of Catamaco is a resort town for well-to-do Mexican people. In other words, if you live in the United States and you might like to go visit Aspen or something like this, down there you might like to go visit, you know, Catamaco. And having nothing to do with any sorcery or occultism or anything like that. Just the, But at the same time, they know that, you know. I don't know how the, the people down there discern this in their mind, but we had a boat captain. They had the old man with them too, the mysterious old man, but the boat captain was implicit that he did not want us to take the serial numbers of you know film him really or film the and so we went and they put me in the water and these are all the pictures that you've got of the you know the rituals of uh, me and Enrique you know being in the uh, the uh, a volcanic lake and everything like this so ultimately uh, what did you uh, what was the purpose of this ritual? what happened uh, you went can you recall what you went through inside? There was a purpose and there was an intention that I went down there with. And that's something that I will give you a hint about, but I will not tell you what it is because I don't want to take the magic off of it or nothing like that. But somebody before they died, somebody I know and that I'm related to, warned me before they died that there was a man that's out to get me. And so the thing is, we're neutralizing these things, and uh, here very soon, there's going to be one less piece of shit in this world. That's all I got to say about that, Miles. So the, there's a guy who got a contract or something, or just a, or no? Just oh, it, oh, way, yeah. way, way worse than that. Yeah. Uh, it's just a man that's got a burning desire. A man who contracts. Are nothing a very incredibly rich man wants nothing more than to destroy me and I was warned by my father and I'm sure that my father would was afraid that I would be powerless to stop this thing and the truth is I'm not I'm fucking I'm working with energies and and I'm whatever I was born to do is something that is happening right now and uh, it's hard to take it all in and understand exactly what's going on with me but um, it's part of a larger you know scenario were you in some way requesting the help of, of that being that, that symbolic in, in every way in every way I, you know it's just like in the days of the you know Greek and wars and all this stuff these people crying out to their pagan gods for, to be saved you know to be to you know, cast their enemies down, fucking ruin those motherfuckers. You know what I mean? I mean God dang, you know, you, 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 you know, if, if my mission means any, anything, you know, to them, you know, 